Hi, good morning. My name is John Sweet. I'm uh, an attorney at the Pennsylvania Utility Law Project. I'm here with Dan Vitek from the Community Justice Project. And um, we are going to present to you on the tenants' rights to utility service. So today, um, just a brief agenda. We're going to talk, we're going to do a little bit of introduction, some background on um, these issues that are unique to, to tenants um, as they relate to utility services. Uh, and then we'll get into the protections from termination, um, talk a little bit about foreign load, what that is and, and how to address that. Um, and then we will get into some issues about landlord billing practices and finish up with some information about um, tenant specific utility assistance issues. Uh, so to begin, um, when we talk about, you know, why do we focus so much uh, on, on tenants' right, access to utility service? Uh, it's helpful to, to take a look at who exactly are the tenants that, that we are representing. Um, this is some data from the 2017, um, the 2017 American Household Survey put on by the U.S. Census. Um, and what this shows... <clears throat> is that diverse households, um, Black, Latinx, Native American households, um, and Asian households are all statistically more likely to be renters. Um, and you can see here for, for Black and Hispanic uh, families are almost twice as likely to be renters than they are to be homeowners. Um, one quarter of tenants pay at least 50% of their income towards housing costs. Um, and at least half of tenants um, experience what's called at least a moderate uh, housing burden uh, where they spend at least 25, 30% uh, or more on their housing costs. Um, and approximately one third of those households uh, have, have children in the household. So specifically um, issues that relate to tenants that as they differ from homeowners. Uh, tenants are often not the named uh, customer, right? They may never see the bill. Um, either the bill is included in rent or the tenant pays the bill and the landlord separately seeks some reimbursement. In those cases, the, the tenant never actually gets to see the bill often. Um, and where the landlord stops paying the bill, the tenant may be terminated uh, without ever actually knowing the bill was overdue. Um, the results of these terminations uh, can lead to children being removed from the household, families facing eviction, and losing their housing subsidies, which is uh, directly correlated and directly leads to homelessness. Um, and also the housing uh, can be condemned and have the family removed with little to no notice uh, which is actually even, in a sense, even worse than uh, being evicted because it's so sudden and uh, and there's no real due process right that comes into play there. Um, and so some of the differences, so we'll talk a little bit, and uh, Dan will be getting into some of the, the tenant protections uh, that apply to regulated and unregulated utilities, um, but it's helpful to start with understanding what the difference is between a regulated and unregulated utility. Uh, so regulated utilities are the large privately owned electric, natural gas, um, and the larger water companies. They're regulated by the PUC. They're required to offer certain consumer protections, uh, such as medical certificates and protections from domestic violence. Um, they also provide access to the PUC formal and informal complaint processes uh, and, and payment agreements uh, from the PUC that are often more lenient than what's offered by the utility. For unregulated utilities, which consist of municipal utilities, co local cooperatives, and, uh, and um, Local cooperatives and municipal authorities, there are no such protections. Um, and, you, and another thing to note there is that the, uh, the bill, the one other main difference is that in, for a regulated utility, the, the bill follows the customer, whereas an unregulated utility, there's often um, municipal lien that attaches. And so there's often uh, that the 
the bill stays with the uh, with the property and does not follow the tenant. And with that, I will hand it off to Dan to discuss the uh, tenant protection from termination. Thanks, John. Um, just to go back to the difference between unregulated and regulated utilities, uh, I, I think most of us as practitioners understand this by now, but the reason that you see most um, tenants having service in their own name for regulated utilities is because, as John pointed out, they don't... Um, you know, if that bill goes unpaid, it doesn't stay with the property. It stays with the tenant. It doesn't become the landlord's problem. But it's the opposite for most municipal um, supplied utilities where the unpaid bill is going to stay with the property as a lien and become the landlord's problem. So you see a lot of um, the bills for municipal um, authorities remaining in the landlord's name, whether or not the tenant is responsible for paying that um, is a different matter. Okay, so when terminating service to a utility service to a tenant, um, the first thing to consider is the two parallel statutes that protect tenants um, when the bill is not in their name. Uh, there's the Utility Service Tenants Rights Act, USTRA, um, which applies to municipal utilities. Um, and then there's its sister act, the discontinuance of service to lease premises, uh, also known as subchapter B because DSLP doesn't really seem to slide off the tongue like Ustra does. Um, but these two st statutes are very similar, right? So Ustra applies to municipal utilities and then the discontinuance of service to lease premises act applies to regulated utilities. Um, and both statutes are very similar in the protections that they provide. Next slide, John. Um, so these, again, these two statutes apply, um, basically when the utility company makes the decision to terminate utility service to the premises um, by, because of non-payment by the landlord, or the landlord uh, calls the company and requests that service be terminated uh, to that account. Um, and then the landlord uh, is the, or some other person is the um, account holder uh, and the tenant is not the, the person responsible on, on the account for paying the utility bill. Um, we'll just point out that in terms of applications, you know, uh, the there is no requirement that um, there be a written lease. Um, you know, Ustra does the the definition of of when a, a when this applies to a tenant um, maybe is a little confusing under the two statutes. Um, you know, most leases will say you know if they, they well. If a tenant's responsible for paying for the utility, right? Does that mean that uh, these statutes don't apply, even though the tenant's name is not on the bill? I would argue no, but I will I will point out to a slight difference in the language in how the two statutes are defined. Uh, under Ustra, it seems pretty clear that if it's not in the tenant's name, then it, uh, you know, then it absolutely applies. The protections apply to that tenant. Um, under the Discontinuance of Service to Lease Premises Act, it's a little less clear, and some utilities are going to interpret that language in the statute to mean that uh, the landlord, the, the, the lease has to be clear that the landlord is responsible for service under the terms of the lease. And, you know, if the tenant's paying the landlord for the utilities, does that mean the landlord's responsible? I would argue yes, but you could also interpret it to mean that the tenant's responsible um, or the landlord's only responsible if they get paid. I, um, you, you'll, you'll see some friction there. Um, another thing to keep in consideration is that this is, you know, the tenant took possession with the utilities on. Um, 
it's not a situation where the tenant's moving into a place that doesn't have any utility service on. Um, and then uh, also terminations for, you know, theft of service or, you know, looks like there's a serious leak or something, though those terminations do not apply uh, th these tenant protections. So what are the tenant protections, right? That, that Austria and the Discontinuance of Service to Lease Premises Act provide. Um, first of all, the tenants are supposed to get specific notice that um, gives them 30 days notice of the termination of the utility. This notice is to the tenants. So there's a separate notice required to the landlord account holder. And um, if that goes unmet, then the utility company has to send the 30 day notice to the tenants. And this notice goes out to um, properties that are reasonably likely to be occupied by affected tenants. Um, and that, that's an interesting standard because of course, you know, the utility company isn't the landlord and they're not necessarily gonna be able to easily determine that in fact, there's tenants there or what their names are, et cetera. But under a reasonably likely standard, they should know that you know, most properties that are tenant occupied um, need to get this notice. The 30 day notice then allows for the tenant to continue service. So to prevent the shutoff, if they pay the last 30 day bill. Um, so if the tenants pay the, the, the last 30 days usage, as I'll say, um, then they get an, to keep the service on for another month. And then if they pay the last 30 days usage after that month, they get another month and so on. In other words, the tenants don't have to pay the full delinquency to keep service on. They only have to pay the last 30 days usage and then every 30 days going forward. Um, the, if, if service is terminated, uh, the tenants do have the right to pay that last 30 days and get the, the service restored. Um, and that, that's the crux of the tenant protection is that not only do they get 30 days notice and they can do whatever they want with that notice, right? They can move out, they can go after the landlord, but they also get the right to keep service on by paying only the last 30 days usage. In a single family unit, that's very helpful. In a multifamily property, uh, less helpful, particularly the larger units, unless the tenants can rally together um, to, to get a payment uh, to cover the full 30-day bill. Next slide. So what happens when the tenants um, are threatened or, or have their utility shut off by the utility provider? Um, of course, under these two statutes, we're just talking about situations where the tenant um, is not the rate payer, right? Doesn't have the bill in their name. If they do have the bill in their name, then you know you're, they're being treated like any other consumer of utility service, and they have to deal with a, a termination, uh, you know, like any any homeowner would, etc. But if they're not the ones who are on the account, they're not the rate payer, then the first thing I do is suggest that you negotiate with the utility provider. Uh, and I'll point out here that, that John and the crew at Pulp have very good contacts for most um, regulated utility companies so that you can cut through the, the bureaucratic tape and, and get to an attorney um, or a higher up uh, supervisor without having to wait on hold or go through too much rigmarole. Um, but of course, calling the tenant, uh, you know, the consumer, uh, you know, services line can also get you connected to someone who can make a decision. And you know, the the idea is you're going to be reminding them that Astra or the Discontinuance of Service to Lease Premises Act applies. That you know, to explain to them that they're that your client is a tenant there. Um, and what I typically do is demand. That they begin from the beginning. That now that they know there's a tenant there, that they follow the the protections of the statute and uh, send a 30 day notice. If the service is terminated, you know an immediate restoration of service 
plus the 30 day notice. Um, you also will find, I think, a, a common snag is the utility company will think that the tenants have to pay the full balance because they're not aware of the statute or maybe even more uh, confounding a situation is where the utility company interprets the statute differently and says the last 30 day bill is something more than what the bill is for the 30 day, the last 30 days usage. Um, you know, just what, to clarify what I mean by that is if you have a, you know, if you have a, if your bill, you know, if there's a bill from 15 days before the termination and that bill sets forth the full amount, that's not the, the bill that has to be paid to, you know, even though it was issued within 30 days of the termination, that's not the last bill. Um, you know, the bill is the, is for the usage over the last 30 days. And unfortunately, a lot of utility companies kind of interpret this, that amount differently than, than us at legal aid. And I think differently than what the, the, the plain language of the statute is. Um, so you, you might have to negotiate over getting service restored, getting a full 30 day notice, and also getting the correct amount for the tenants to, um, to pay in order to restore or maintain service. Just a, a little caveat to um, regulated utilities. What I find with regulated utilities when I go to negotiate with them about a violation of, of tenants' rights is that they are very quick under almost any circumstance to put the bill in the tenant's name. And I think that th that's different than uh, a, a municipal utility. The reason being, I assume, is because the, the PUC regulated utilities, they don't care. You know, they know they're not worried that the landlord's going to get mad or the property owner is going to get mad because that utility bill just stays with the, the account holder, the tenant. Um, and so they're, all, you know, they sort of think, well, okay, the landlord owes a bill or whoever it is that owes this bill that we're shutting off for, but we won't shut off if you just put the bill in your name, then, then there's no problem here. Um, and that's, you know, most times the tenants are fine with that. And, you know, it's a 15 minute conversation and, you know, an application process and, and the water or electric or gas gets restored and the tenant has a bill now in their name. Um, but that's certainly not required under the statute. The, it's, it's very specific that the tenant is not required to assume the bill uh, or to put the bill in their own name. And there might be many reasons why they don't want to do that. Maybe there's a foreign load. Maybe they don't plan on staying all that long. Um, maybe it's a multifamily property and you know they don't want the personal responsibility of having to pay a bill for more than just their usage, et cetera. Um, so just keep in mind, sometimes, you know, especially in a single family situation, your client's fine with just cutting to the chase, getting their utility on or stopping the termination by putting it in their own name. Um, but other times they're not, and you should push back on that. Um, I, I see there's a question here, what would happen if there's an outstanding balance due? Um, and I guess that's another scenario where the tenant shouldn't be required to put the bill in their name. Um, I interpret that question to mean, what if the tenant had a prior account that they didn't pay? And so in order to get service in their own name, they'd be required to, typically they'd be required to pay the back bill that they owed from whatever property they'd past lived in um, before they could um, get a bill in their own name. Well, so, okay, so the tenant rights, you know, these, these tenants' rights under these statutes, I think, protect against that possibility by specifically saying the tenant does not have to put their, the, the bill in their name. Uh, and so in a situation where the tenant wouldn't typically be able to get a bill in their name for whatever reason, maybe they owe, owe a past balance, um, they should be able to just pay the last 30 days usage and keep the bill on in the landlord's name. And remember the logic here. The tenant is not getting something for free. 
They're getting a month's worth of utility service by paying the last months. And if they want to continue, they pay another month and another. So the landlord's bill or whoever the rate payer is, um, is not going to be increasing. I mean, maybe a little bit, right? Maybe it's decreasing. Um, but, you know, essentially the utility company is going to be made whole for the usage that goes on. Um, and the, the landlord or the rate payer is not going to be losing, you know, or having a bill build up at all because the tenant is paying for their usage, essentially. Um, so you should be able to use that logic to push back against um, anybody who's demanding the tenant put it in their name or, or sort of refusing to comply with these, um, with these tenant rights. Now, if negotiations doesn't work, um, you can complain to the attorney general's office. Uh, I found I found that to be helpful during the pandemic, when the attorney general's office of consumer protection was was dedicated to responding to landlord tenant issues pretty quickly. In fact, I had a, an example um, last Thanksgiving, the day before Thanksgiving. Uh, the utility company shut off my client's utilities. It was water um, provided by uh, Pennsylvania American Water. At the request of the landlord, you know, not a great time to have utilities shut off, given that it's the holiday the next day, uh, and that you know that's what four days that you're going to be waiting before you can get in touch with anybody. Uh, and so, after struggling with the utility company myself, the I contacted the attorney general's office, and their um, attorney reached out and immediately got a different result than I did. Um, so that's another avenue. Um, a third option for regulated utilities is to file a complaint with the PUC. That's totally acceptable. Um, the problem there is that those complaints do take time to process. And so if the utility service is already off, that might not be the best option, uh, similar to my situation on Thanksgiving. You know, we did file a complaint, but um, that complaint wasn't going to get looked at until after the holiday. Um, then the final resolution is a private cause of action. And I cite the case um, that held Ustra does have an implied uh, private cause of action. Um, and so at least for equitable relief, you have a clear avenue for going into court and, um, and getting the utility restored or getting the 30-day notice properly issued, uh, or getting the, the amount that the tenant has to pay to be properly determined. I'd, I'd also throw in there that if you end up having to go to court uh, and you're seeking you know, an injunction under Astra, you may want to consider other claims. Um, you know, This is probably a violation of the unfair trade practice and consumer protection law. And a question as to whether the utility company is acting as a, um, you know, acting as a person under that statute. Um, municipal utilities may not be, um, you know, that's that's a question. Um, but there's also um, sort of a parallel claim under violation of due process because the utility probably shut the tenant off without informing them of their rights to go through this process provided by Ustra or the Discontinuance of Service to Tenants' Rights Act. Um, and there's good case law about utility service sort of being a right and um, requiring due process before its termination. Um, particularly municipal utilities are always going to fall under that requirement for due process because they're government actors. Hi, Dan. Um, yeah. I just want to jump in for a minute. So uh, on, while we're talking about the filing of the injunction, I'm going to um, put a sample pleading into the chat box that Dan and I had uh, put together based on um, a case that Dan had filed in Allegheny um, Court of Common Pleas a couple of years ago. Um, we'll try to make that available through the Sketch app also, but um, um, wanted to make sure that there is uh, that people are able to access the Word document because I'm not sure if we can get Word into the schedule. Um, 
and then also um, we had a question come in from Marguerite um, about a, uh, a case where PWSA uh, would not mark her client's home as a tenant home because it was a single family home and that they eventually, um, she was able to work something out, but they eventually uh, put the landlord's back balance onto the, the tenant's new account and she got terminated. So that's a long complicated, I think that's a, that's a bit thick to get into right now, Marguerite, um, that is absolutely wrong what they did. Um, and in that case, if that happens to anybody, I would recommend that you uh, move forward on, on possibly filing the injunction that, that we uh, put in the chat box. Um, and then Marguerite, I'd like to ask that you reach directly out to uh, Dan and I um, at, at, with the emails. Our emails are at the end of this um, and we can um, take a closer look at that. And Dan, I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah, well, well, thanks for that um, question because I think it, it's, it just highlights one of the, the few things that you have that, that come up repeatedly with these two statutes. Um, you know, if a tenant is living in the building and they're not the rate payer and the utility company is terminating the service, whether it's for non-payment of the bill or at the request of the rate payer, Ustra and the Discontinuance of Service to Lease Premises Act apply. There's no, there's no question about that. Um, it's not a question of reasonably occupied, et cetera. It's the, the tenant exists there. Um, so there might be a little bit of convincing to the authority um, that the tenant actually lives there. Um, you know, sometimes the authorities are, or the utility companies are, are skeptical that this isn't just another, you know, family member or something trying to, to you know, trying to avoid having the bill, the water shut off because their husband won't pay the bill or something. Um, but, you know, you, you should be able to resolve that with proof that the ten, it's a tenant, the tenant lives there and it doesn't have to be a lease and it shouldn't be a lease. That shouldn't be a requirement. And so, you know, whether it's reasonably likely to be occupied or not is irrelevant if the tenant is living there. I think that, um, the reasonably likely to be occupied standard is something to, to look into on like a broader claim against the utility provider if they're routinely um, ignoring the, the tenant rights notices and et cetera for, for properties that are tenant occupied. Um, because there's many reasons, there's many ways to that, there's many things that would suggest a property is reasonably likely to be occupied by a tenant. It not just that it has multiple dwellings. Um, you know, single family homes. If the landlord doesn't live there, then the billing address for the ratepayer is often different than the service address. Ding, 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 ding. You know, that's a tenant occupied property. Um, if the ratepayer has multiple, um, you know, service uh, service addresses on their account or has multiple accounts. Ding, ding, ding. You know, they're likely to be a landlord and thus their properties are likely to be tenant occupied. Um, if there's been a tenant there before, I mean, there's lots of things. Um, and so I would encourage people who are seeing repeat offenders to contact Pulp and CJP about doing, you know, a, a broader uh, look into their practices at that utility company and whether we could negotiate or, or have to do litigation to get them to, um, you know, a, apply these statutes preemptively better. Um, but if, if you're in a situation where the tenant actually is just is living there, uh, then there, there's no question. And the, the utility company has to go back to the beginning and start over. Thanks. And I think um, Kelly wants to run a, uh, the first poll now. I do. Thank you. Um, this is for attorneys. I am launching the first of the CLE poll questions now. You'll have two minutes to respond. Um, this is the first of two, and you have to respond to both. So thanks. Please feel free to continue. Okay. Um, so there are some additional um, tenant protections that are laid out in the statute. Uh, for instance, the tenant has the right per the statute to deduct the amount they're paying to the utility company to keep utilities on. 
from rent so they can offset what they pay in utilities for rent. Um, there's a clause that prevents retaliation by the landlord. Um, and um, and then there's a, there's a waiver clause. You know, there's no waiving this right under Astra in a lease um, or any other document. Uh, so those are all void. And then I just just want to point out that again, this applies to the ratepayer voluntarily terminating service. Um, you know, a lot of times the landlord will just call up and to the utility company say, "I want to end service." Um, and the, the utility company will say, okay, you're, you're the ratepayer, we'll do that. Um, but the tenant protections absolutely apply in that situation too. And that's to prevent constructive evictions, the, the landlord using the utility company to constructively evict the tenant. Okay, one thing I wanna point out, um, maybe a, a somewhat misunderstood statute and right, is the Water Services Act. Now, remember, if there's a utility, uh, well, if there's, if there's sewer um, that's not being paid, then the sewer utility can contact the water utility if they're separate and terminate the water service due to the non-payment of the sewer service, right? And that makes sense, right? You can't shut someone's sewer off, it's just a hole. Um, so you shut the water off instead. But the Water Services Act that allows for this to happen um, comes with some additional tenant protections. Uh, one, it requires written notice uh, before the termination of the water utility. Um, and two, um, it requires an opportunity to, to contest the charges uh, on a good faith dispute. And they have to, there, there can't be a termination of the, of the water service once a tenant has, or any account holder has contested the termination of the water because of the, of the sewer um, issue until there's a judicial determination, whatever that means. Um, but that's, you know, significant because uh, the municipal authority or the utility company that's that is shutting off the water or that is requesting the water to be shut off, you know, their own internal decision, um, even if there's an administrative process is not judicial determination. Um, and then uh, the, the, it says that the, they can't hold the current leasee responsible for failure to pay the bill of the previous leasee. Um, so just, you know, an added protection for um, a tenant who who is losing lo losing utility ser water service because the sewer isn't paid. Um, if there's a back balance, uh, another thing I'll note is that Ustra applies to the termination of water service uh, due to to non-payment of the sewer bill. That's in the Water Services Act um, itself. So all the protections we just talked about apply, plus uh, these additional somewhat vague, uh, but no less important uh, protections for when the water is being terminated because of the sewer bill. All right, now what we just talked about, of course, was when the utility company terminates the utility service, um, but what if the landlord does it themselves, right? That they, they go to the tap uh, they turn the knob, they cut the line, however they, they do it. Um, you know, in, in those situations, you're generally talking about an illegal lockout or constructive eviction. That's the way I see it. Uh, and it should be treated the same way um, as a landlord changing the locks um, or removing the door, right? That you're gonna, it's illegal um, and that you're looking to go in for an injunction to uh, force the landlord to turn back on the utilities. Now, one thing that might be slightly different in a, in a situation where the landlord has cut the utilities and you're going in for an injunction, to, just to keep in mind, is the uh, injunction bond, right? So in Pennsylvania, you have to pay a bond in order to receive a preliminary injunction. Um, typically, I ask for a nominal bond of $1. 
which is usually granted, especially in uh, self-help eviction cases, because the law is so clear that it's wrong, right? In a utility case, uh, I've had judges want the tenant to post a bond of one month's utility charge. Uh, and that's usually because the landlord's squawking that they haven't got rent and they can't uh, pay the utility, uh, they can't afford it, right? Um, and so, well, most courts will recognize that as an illegal constructive eviction. They, you, you might wanna just prepare your client for the possibility of uh, a larger bond than typical um, in that injunctive relief. Um, you can also ask for tort damages, you know, constructive eviction uh, could be a trespass claim, could be a conversion of property claim. Uh, it's certainly, I think, an unlawful eviction complaint uh, claim. And then another one that, um, you know, is actionable in Pennsylvania is intentional infliction of emotional distress, um, you know, separate from negligent infliction of, in, of emotional distress with intentional infliction. In Pennsylvania, you don't have to have medical evidence of the of the distress, um, so you can sort of, you know, your case isn't going to get bounced because your client didn't go to a doctor and seek, you know, treatment from a therapist or something. Um, and you know, the landlord tenant relationship has been established as, you know, one where the the landlord has a duty and um, by shutting off the utilities on purpose, they're breaching that and and causing uh, emotional distress. Um, so just something to think about, especially if you're already going in on an injunction and you want to hit the, the landlord with, with something more than just the, you know, court saying, go put this back on. Um, additionally, the attorney general, again, during the pandemic, uh, their office seemed very helpful and willing to engage landlords quickly. Um, and see this as a clear violation of the Landlord Tenant Act and, and a clear constructive eviction. So they would, you know, the investigator would call the landlord and explain to them that whatever the landlord is thinking that justifies doing this, they're wrong. Um, I do want to point out though that in this in the scenario where the utility, you know, say water is paid separate from the rent and is the tenant's responsibility under the lease. Um, and the, the tenant fails to pay that for that utility. Um, you know, there's the potential there for the court to interpret that differently than a tenant failing to pay rent and the landlord using self-help to evict. Um, I, you know, I certainly would argue that the tenant renting, you know, is, is, you know, utility services are part of that. And self-help is just as illegal in changing the locks um, as it is in shutting the utility service off. But I know that some jurisdictions, there are judges who don't exactly see it that way. And so I just want to make people aware that, that could be a different situation. Um, but what we probably need to do is, is get some case law in the appellate level clarifying that because um, I really don't see a, a difference there um, in terms of, you know, protecting the public interest and um, making sure there isn't a breach of the peace. All right. So I'll be um, stepping back in to discuss um, some uh, foreign load uh, so the foreign load um, is a, first of all, apologies for the somewhat problematic terminology there, um, but it's a, this is how it's colloquially known and um, I'm not really clear on how we can uh, discuss this without using that term. Um, but it's a, it's a subsection of the Discontinuance of Service to Lease Premises Act. Um, and it has to do with a situation where a um, a unit is that individually metered unit is connected has their 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 meter connected to either a part of the common area or the part of another uh, unit, and the tenant is then paying 
uh, more than they should because they're because the usage from either the common area or the other unit is showing up on their bill. Um, so the section that controls this is 1529.1. Um, and so what that says is that when a, whenever a landlord has a unit that is not individually metered, they have to inform the utility company of that fact. Um, and so when they do that, um, a master, that's called a master metered property, the bill would have to be, is required to be in the landlord's name in those situations. Um, and so where the foreign load provision comes in is that where the end of, where the the property is individually metered, but is uh, paying is connected to another part of the building that's not technically individually metered. Um, and so under the statute, the the bill should be for that even on that meter should be in the landlord's name. Um, and so the where that comes into play uh, in the cases that we handle is the subsection C on the failure to give notice. So where the landlord has failed to tell the utility that this is a rental property um, and that it is not that it is not individually metered or that the meter is connected to some other part of the building. Uh, when if the utility is then informed of that fact, the utility is required to switch the bill into the landlord's name. The landlord becomes responsible for the bill moving forward until the issue is corrected. And so how would you know, how do you identify if you have foreign load on your meter? Um, usually the, the big red flag would be inexplicably high usage. Um, and so it would typically be usage that existed the whole time, right? Usually they, they don't come in and, and rewire the building. So this would be con consistent and explicably high usage. Um, and the way to check that would be to turn off all the breakers to your apartment if you have access to them. Uh, and then check your meter and see if the meter is not moving. Um, you check the lights in the common area that you have access to to see if they're um, if they're still on. And you can ask your neighbors if there are any uh, any lights that went off. Usually the neighbors would you know let you know that the lights in their apartment went off. Um, but you can ask around. But if you don't have access to the breakers um, or you try this and and um, nothing happens or your neighbors don't want to talk to you, uh, you can call the utility company and request a foreign load investigation. Again, this, uh, because this is under discontinuance of service of these premises act, it only applies to regulated utilities. Uh, they will send someone out to conduct a, to conduct an investigation. Uh, but just note that some utilities do attempt to charge an investigation fee uh, in these cases. Um, and if that's the case, you can uh, reach out to Pulp and we can try to help your client get that fee waived. Um, and we are in a consistent, um, ad consistently advocating for the utilities to remove those types of fees from their tariffs. So once the utility, once the foreign loans identified what happens next, the utility should switch the bill into the landlord's name. Any outstanding balance would remain would go with that bill to the landlord's name uh, until the wiring issue is corrected. And at that point, it could be, it can be put back into the tenant's name, um, but neither the utility nor the PUC is gonna credit the client for the amounts that they may have already paid uh, during the time that they were paying for other parts of the building. So that leaves the tenant with, with two options um, as to if they think that they're entitled to recovery of those amounts. The first would be to um, to deduct that from the rent, uh, similar to what you would do um, on the uh, some of the issues that, that Dan was just talking about, where the the tenant is paying is winds up paying um, for utility service that they're not otherwise uh, liable for. Um, so if you're going to do that in any of these cases, 
the practice tip would be to follow the written notice procedures that you would follow if you were doing a, a repair and deduct case. So typically you would uh, send the landlord a letter letting them know um, that you have been charged this amount. You don't think that you were required to pay it and that you intend to uh, deduct that from your rent moving forward um, and then proceed to deduct the rent. Um, you know, I think there's a usually best practice would be to actually send a second letter. Um, and then another option would be to institute a lawsuit against the landlord. Uh, and if the landlord knowingly misrepresented, so the landlord knew that you were um, you were paying for service to another apartment or to the common area, and they, they purposefully did not tell you that, and you can prove that in court, you can um, possibly pursue an unfair trade practices claim to get trouble damages for those amounts. But just note that there is a question as to whether and how much the tenant remains responsible for the actual usage to their unit, separate and apart from the uh, from the foreign loan, um, and so that's sort of an open question. Um, as an advocate, we would say that the you know that whole bill should have been in the landlord's name the whole time because that's that's really kind of what the statute says. Um, but there's an argument to be made, right, that you would have to figure out how much how much that your tenant was actually using versus how much of that usage was going to a separate part of the building. Um, and the only real way to figure that out would be once the um, once the for, once the wiring issue has been corrected, and the tenant would then get a new bill, and you could see you know, over a few months. What the average, uh, the difference in the average usage would be between those two uh, bills, um, and that that could be a way to gauge that. Um, of course, that applies really in, for these two um, these two approaches. That have come, this comes into play a little bit because of the the burden of proof. So, if, if you deduct from the rent and the landlord moves to evict, it's on the landlord. Um, the burden of proof is on the landlord to prove that um, you owe those amounts. Versus if you're suing the landlord, um, it could be argued that you carry the burden of proof to show that that the, uh, the, that the landlord owes that amount. Um, and then another open question here that's kind of a warning sign, uh, the protection from retaliation provision. Um, and so in the statute, the, the protection from retaliation provision that this continues as the Service of Lease Premises Act applies to 1527 and 1529. Uh, foreign load provision is 1529.1. And it's the only one, uh, the only uh, dot one in the act. Um, and so it is um, uh, protection for retaliation should apply, right? I, I would say that that's an extension of 1529. Um, but it's it's something to note. Yeah, John, if I could just jump in before we move on to the next section, and you know, my my two cents on it, I, I see this mostly. You know, this comes up when the tenant's being evicted for non-payment, and the landlord raises the issue of not paying the utilities, and at some point there's a foreign load determination, um, and I always argue that. The tenant's not responsible at all for the bill, but I will admit that the statute is vague on this, uh, perhaps too vague to really use it to point to much, and um, there's no case law, uh, even out of the PUC, about you know who's responsible for what when there's a foreign load. Um, so I, you know, if anybody does develop uh, a good argument. Uh, in this situation to, to show that the tenant shouldn't have to pay any of the bill, uh, even if the lease re requires that they pay that bill, um, let us know. Uh, and I, the last thing I'll say is that often the tenant will get a copy of the notice that goes to the landlord informing the landlord of the foreign load and that the bill has been placed in their name. And that notice can be helpful because what I've, I've found in those notices is that they sort of get rid of the nuance of the statute and just say, 
the landlord is responsible for the bill. Um, and that, that can be convincing to a panel of arbitrators or a judge um, in a landlord tenant case. Also, um, before we move on to the next section, there's a question in the chat about the, the last section when we raised the Water Service Act. Um, and it, it says, you know, if, if the water is being shut off because the sewer bill is not being paid and the, the resident uh, wants to dispute the, you know, the sewer um, bill, who do they send that dispute to? The sewer company that's asked for the water to be shut off or the water company that's going to actually shut off the water? And I think intuitively you'd think, well, the sewer company, because they're the ones who are going to know whether or not the, the tenant's dispute is accurate. And they're the ones who are asking for the water to shut off. But if you read the statute, the language of the statute says the tenant, or I'm, I'm sorry, it shouldn't be the tenant, the, whoever is challenging the, uh, the sewer bill is to contact the water authority or the, the water utility company. Um, so my answer to this question is you contact both. You contact the water authority because that's what the statute says and because they're the ones who need to be told of this quickly. And you contact the sewer authority because they're the ones who ultimately have to resolve this dispute and, and take it to court. And the ones you, you're probably going to have to enjoin from telling the water company what to do. Um, but hopefully, you know, the water company would recognize that they've done something wrong and that they don't have the right to shut off term service if you raise to them the Water Services Act. Um, and that'll give you time to go back to the sewer company. So, I'm sorry, not a really clear answer to that question, but. Yeah, yeah, I'd say the right answer is both. Try to get them all on the phone at the same time, really, because you're just going to get the, the runaround back and forth. Um, between the sewer company is going to blame the water company, water company is going to blame the sewer company. Um, uh, uh, Kelly wants to run another poll. Kelly, you can go ahead and run that poll. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and launch the second CLE poll box. This will be up for two minutes. Please respond for CLE credit. And please feel free to continue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, I want to touch briefly on some of these billing issues, right? When a landlord, when the bill is in the landlord's name, how does the landlord then go about getting that money out of the tenant? Um, and so they often will charge a, a flat rate, um, usually built in either, you know, separate and apart from the rent or built into the rent. Um, sometimes they charge on a per person uh, metric, which, uh, can be problematic when it comes when concerning um, discrimination about uh, family makeup. Uh, square footage can be a, a fair way to do it if we're talking about electric and natural gas. Um, um, or they write the landlord just hands the bill over to the tenant and has the tenant pay. Um, the two pro most problematic situations are going to be where it's a situation where the landlord just says, you pay what I say you pay. Um, I'm going to tell you what the bill was, but not show you what it was. Um, and that often leads us into these USTRA and DSLPA situations where the tenant refuses to pay an amount that, they're, that they haven't been informed of and then they wind up at risk of termination. Um, and so in those cases, we will usually try to, to employ the, the protections um, in the discontinuous uh, uh, DSLPA and, and USTRA. Um, because the bill is in the landlord's name. Um, the other really problematic issue is submetering. Um, and this is where the landlord individually meters the property themselves. Uh, this comes with a whole host of problems. The tenants wind up losing all consumer protections, um, including notice before termination. Uh, they wind up at risk for eviction due to just a late utility bill. Um, and some things to note here that when we're talking about how much, if, if a unit winds up being individually metered, how much can a landlord charge a tenant? Um, the, the bill should be, the total bill should be no more than the amount that the utility would have charged that customer directly under their residential rate. Um, and so 
another problem there, right, is that you know landlords are often charged a commercial rate, which can be lower than the residential rate, and then they 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 wind up reselling that to the to the tenant as something akin to the the utilities residential rate. Um, that is that's also can be problematic because they'll try to put fees on top of that and then say that that they're charging the same, but the actual bill, if the actual bill is higher, they have violated the statute. And this is actually a, a criminal offense. This is a summary offense. Um, so if the landlord is doing this to your client, they're liable for under they're liable for a summary offense, um, which is uh, similar to like a small uh, retail, th a, a uh, low level retail theft. They'd be sentenced to pay a fine of one hundred dollars multiplied by the total number of bills rendered that exceeded the what the utility would have paid. So that can um, that can be a pretty large amount if you're talking about something that's happening in a in a in a mobile home park or in a multifamily property over a large uh, a long period of time. Um, and before we end, I just wanted to touch on a couple. Uh, unique utility assistance issues coming up. I just wanted to remind everybody about the emergency rental and, and assistance repair program. Also now the and utility in there because you can get amounts for overdue utility bills through the ERAP. Um, and you can get up to 12 months of utility arrears as part of those grants. Uh, you can apply through Compass and there's more information about that on um, Pulp's website and on the Compass website. Um, and also the upcoming low income household water assistance program, uh, which is um, modeled after the LIHEAP program, but does not um, exactly reflect the LIHEAP program. Um, and through this program, there's uh, between 25 and two, $2,500 grants available to, to facilitate reconnection or prevent termination. Um, uh, so if you want more information about, this is going to launch in January 2022. If you want more information about that, Pulp has two webinars coming up um, in November, one for utility providers uh, and one for social and legal services providers on November 15th. Uh, and finally, just a couple changes to the LIHEAP program and, and just to talk about how that applies some unique um, situations where that applies to tenants. Uh, cash and crisis uh, had increased significantly in 2021. Um, and for tenants who pay heat as an undesignated portion of their rent, um, they still are eligible for cash grants, but can only be awarded 50%. Um, unless it's a tenant that pays their rent based on a portion of a percentage of their income, um, which is sometimes happens in public housing. Um, and in those cases, they wouldn't be eligible. Um, uh, and if he is a designated portion of the rent um, where it's spelled out, then they can, they can be eligible for a full crack cash grant. And uh, in both of those situations, the grant would be paid directly to the tenant and not to the landlord. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank everybody for participating. Um, Dan and mine uh, information, our contact information is here if you have any more questions. Also, there's a link to the uh, websites for Pulp and CLS um, where you can find more information about some of the stuff we talked about today. Yeah, and if I could just squeeze in a little plug uh, for myself, I, I, I've seen um, this issue of submetering developing more and more. Uh, it's particularly become popular in mobile home parks from my experience, but I think it's coming to a multifamily property near you as well. And there's a lot of questions around what a utility, like a third service um, billing company can do. Uh, you know, can they charge fees in addition to what the cost of the utility is? Um, what are the disclosures required for those fees? Can they shut off service if the tenant doesn't pay them? Um, and so as that becomes more popular, people should, should contact uh, me and uh, if they wanna you know, consider doing some litigation in that area, um, 
if they, you know, if, if they don't want to take that on themselves, I'd be happy to co-counsel in something like that. And I think John actually has a, an interesting example where he just was working on a rate case with an electric utility provider out in Pittsburgh that prohibits submetering uh, in their tariff. And a submetering company came in and tried to challenge that uh, tariff term. Uh, I believe, John, the PUC uh, ruled in favor of the um, utility company that they could continue to require that. That's um, right. Yeah, that, that, so that's a case. Um, and may, actually, Liz and, Liz and Rhea and Harry were really um, at, at, at the lead on that case, um, but they did a great job uh, fending them off. Um, it's currently in the early stages of an appeal process. The, the, the submetering company has appealed that um, there. But uh, I'd say keep a lookout for that. They do operate that the company, the specific company that we're talking about, um, operates in um, in the Pico service territory down in Philadelphia. So if you run into submetering issues down there, um, let CLS or or Pulp know. And um, they there's also a couple companies operating in Northeast Pennsylvania that we're aware of that are doing um, natural gas and water submetering. Um, that we were seeing some problematic issues with. So right. uh, keep us- I mean, going. yeah, just to be clear, essentially these companies want to come in and make money by being a useless, you know, middleman <laughs> in a situation where it, we've been fine without them. <laughs> they see an opportunity to stick the tenants with uh, a bill and literally provide them no other benefit, no benefit, no change in service, just, we're going to bill you because you're not the landlord uh, rate payer. So it seems pretty outrageous to me, but it's also, it doesn't seem very re well regulated at the moment. Um, so keep your eyes out for that. And um, so I just noticed that when I thought I had uploaded the materials to the chat box earlier today, I had only sent them to Dan. So I just, uh, I just uploaded them again um, in the chat box. They should be, I'm going to be um, sending them over to Kelly to make sure they get into the to the SCED app um, uh, as soon as as soon as they can get in there. Okay, well, thank you, John and Dan, for being with us today and for sharing all of the helpful information. And everybody, have a great evening. Take care. Bye, everyone. Thank you.